Good morning. Thank you for being here early in the Saturday morning. And well, we have a nice round table anti on antithrombotic treatment. I'm Jose Luis Ferreira, I'm an interventional cardiologist from uh, Hospital de Belviche in Barcelona. And uh, my co-chair is Immaculada Roldán from Hospital de La Paz. And we are both the coordinators of the Spanish group of cardiovascular thrombosis of the Spanish Society of Cardiology. Uh, first thing first, I, want, I really want to thank our three international speakers for being here. We know that you have really, really tight schedules, and we, really, we are really grateful for having you here with us. So let's get started with the first uh, talk, which is called Individualizing Duration of Dual Antiplatelet Therapy in ACS Patients Undergoing Coronary Stenting, a Practical Approach Beyond the Scores by Dr. Giuseppe Beyond the OK. Thank you for... Thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation and uh, it's a pleasure being here in Santiago and uh, being part of this very uh, distinguished uh, faculty. So this is a, a quite of a, a fascinating topic because uh, it builds upon our ongoing experience in trials and uh, patients. Basically, how can we individualize the duration of dual antibiotic therapy in unstable patients undergoing coronary stenting? Um, actually, it's very tough to address this uh, lecture, so uh, you will have to be uh, uh, gentle and kind with me uh, because I will try to find a way, but uh, it's uh, highly debatable whether my way would be uh, yours or similar to others. This is my disclosure. So basically, uh, why should we prolong GPT after glucose stent implantation or a bare metal stent? which, however, would probably be uh, a bailout solution in ACS. Uh, first of all, because we might want to reduce the risk of stent thrombosis, which is, however, today uh, reasonably low with new generation devices. And for a patient perspective, because we might like to reduce the risk of myocardial infarction or possibly the risk of ischemic stroke. Of course, uh, uh, down, the, 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 downside, the downside is that we might increase bleeding risk uh, and this could increase uh, the risk of death. We have a number of trials. Most trials were done in stable patients or uh, in low risk ACS patients. And it's very difficult to find a way. Um, we might use vote counting. We might say the largest trial is prevailing, or the, the best trial, or the trial from my country, or uh, the trial using a given drug routine stent. It's difficult to find a way, as I was telling you. And uh, uh, this is an ongoing uh, research topic. Uh, of course, the key problem here is that uh, at the beginning of the research endeavor, probably we were not able to um, be precise enough. Now uh, it's difficult to be uh, actually uh, incremental uh, with any additional trial. So we need to understand that probably uh, we have uh, more or less all the factors uh, and we are still stuck uh, with the complex uh, equation which might be difficult to solve. So quoting physics, uh, if you want to know the speed of uh, an electron, you can tell where it is uh, and the other way around. So probably we need to be very pragmatic in this. And uh, we've done a number of research, uh, which were um, uh, research projects which were coordinated by Tullio Palmerini from Bologna, who really um, worked uh, very hard in trying to set up a collaboration and identifying some pros and cons uh, of uh, uh, extended DPT. Uh, these were mainly stable patients, and mm, we did find uh, that the longer DPT was better for ischemic endpoints. Uh, non-fatal and fatal, um, but when we uh, focused more on uh, on um, comprehensive effort, because of course some trials provided the, their patient level data, other trials did not, and irrespective of that, the, the best scenario would be to be able to um, uh, export and uh, infer the data from a given trial uh, in terms of effects on another trial with a technique which is called network meta-analysis, which is, uh, of course, uh, a technique which has uh, limitations but uh, can still be um, meaningfully insightful. And <clears throat> this is a 
one of the efforts we did many actually network meta analysis probably we are you know the the the, the most productive group uh, in in the world which is not in itself necessarily a good thing but um as you can see a number of trials uh, and uh, um as you can see uh prolonged uh, DPT was beneficial uh, in um, patients with unstable uh, coronary artery disease uh, with ACS, where it was not that beneficial in stable patients. My view is that actually using ACS as a label is quite naive uh, and doesn't capture the patient features correctly. Uh, yet, as we can see, it depends a lot on the duration itself. So, of course, three months versus 12 is... Uh, um, really not a smart idea, but uh, uh, other comparisons are smarter and uh, mm, also mm, several of the trials uh, uh, used uh, um, uh, old generation uh, um, mm, antiplatelet therapy. Of course, the elephant in the room is the DAPT trial, which is a very big trial um, from the US, uh, which had the specific agenda um, and uh, which found out uh, uh, that when you do a very big trial, you end up uh, uh, you know, building a very complex uh, object which has many, many dimensions. And a simple two-dimensional view or three-dimensional view cannot capture it. In the end, they found that uh, prolonging the APT was beneficial, especially in patients uh, with prior myocardial infarction or, um, say, ACS. It was a little bit less beneficial in stable patients. Um, of course, there was a, a significant benefit of cell thrombosis which was uh, um, a primary endpoint, uh, a significant benefit on uh, MACE and uh, stroke. Um, of course, not unexpectedly, um, there was uh, an increase in bleeding. Uh, the, the striking finding was that, uh, unfortunately, um, there was an excess of deaths in, in the, the patients with prolonged APT. So the, the, the the question was, uh, how can we um, justify this? How can we predict which patients will be at high risk? So this is the, the, the topic mainly. And as you can see, they uh, went along uh, creating a score, which is a kind of funny because typically uh, big trials, they don't want to use scores. They just want to, uh, everybody to use that treatment in all the patients. So the, the very fact that they tried to build the score means that they couldn't find a simple you know, take-home message. But in the end, the DAPT score helps you to um, stratify patients, and so you have a benefit if you have um, a score of two or higher from prone DPT, where you probably need not to use this prone DPT if you have a lower score. <coughs> And as you can see, this is the difference in death. So um, uh, probably the, the striking thing again is that there is no benefit in death if you have a high DPT score, whereas there is definitely a hazard in terms of mortality if you have a low DPT score. So actually the message goes the other way around if you really believe in scores, uh, which is kind of debatable because the best score will be able to classify correctly only 90% of patients, typically, at best, or even worse than that. Uh, so again, um, does this make sense? Yes, unfortunately, prolonged APT is probably associated with um, um, an increased risk of death and shorter DPT, especially with new generation devices, with the, the typical patients we treat, which are not very complex patients, uh, they, they probably don't need very prolonged APT. And, uh, Okay, um, this probably has to do with bleeding-related deaths. So despite being not very common, they are very difficult to, to, to treat and they are very fatal. <clears throat> um, uh, trying to, to, to wrap it up, uh, we have scores, of course. So again, the DAPT score, which is a very nice score, factoring in age, uh, smoking, MI presentation, prior PCI, Paclet Axel, eluting stent, of course, this is something very, very fancy, but uh, with an historical um, uh, relevance, a, which is a score you should use uh, 12 months after, uh, you know, implanting a stent. Uh, 
whereas you can have a score which guides you uh, in the short term, size, such as the precise depth, but there are many others. Again, uh, some things are meaningful, some others are a little bit uh, more um, debatable. Um, our practical approach is, uh, is to try to define what is most prevalent, so uh, bleeding risk or ischemic risk. Probably if bleeding risk is very, very prevalent, it's very, very dominant, you probably should aim for mid or short-term DAPT. And this is going to be uh, defendable uh, even with uh, uh, other physicians or in case of complications. If the, the bleeding risk is standard or not very high, then the ischemic risk is uh, uh, more pregnant, more uh, uh, important, and uh, uh, complexity of PCI and uh, uh, significance of uh, extent of coronary artery disease and so forth is probably most important. And in the middle, probably, I think you could, we could stick to 12 months, more or less. Um, so to conclude, uh, um, Again, prolonged DPT after ECS does reduce the risk of ischemic events, but also does increase the bleeding risk. Uh, DPT duration is probably best individualized uh, for patients and for physicians. Probably you should create your own practical approach and stick to that. Um, uh, even in ACS patients, you may uh, uh, apply your judgment. Uh, Though, um, however, most ACS patients should be treated with at least one year DPT um, in patients at low risk of bleeding and high ischemic risk, for instance, complex CC CAD, it is reasonable to continue DPT for longer than one year, whereas in patients at high risk of bleeding and low risk of ischemic events, such as a focal lesion treated with, uh, with the new generation drug gluten stent, DPT should probably be limited to six months or even less depending on the magnitude of the bleeding risk. Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Now we are going to move to the next one because the discussion is going to be taken at the end of the session. Okay, the next speaker is a very well-known speaker because she was here at the last meeting is Felicita Andreotti from Roma, and he, she is going to, to talk about the antithrombotic therapy in acute coronary syndrome in patients with atrial fibrillation and stent. You can proceed. Thank you very much. Dear chairs, dear colleagues, good morning. The topic is management of antithrombotic therapy in ACS patients with atrial fibrillation undergoing PCI. Here are my potential conflicts. Issues at stake. Why are we discussing the topic? Because we want to preserve efficacy without inducing excessive bleeds, obviously. Who are we talking about? Well, the, the title is ACS plus PCI with atrial fibrillation, but it could probably also apply to ACS alone or to PCI alone, with or without ACS. And the atrial fibrillation we're discussing today is non so-called non-valvular paroxysmal persistent long-standing permanent. And what are the antithrombotic agents? P2Y12 inhibitors, definitely, at least in the early stage, we'll try to see why, aspirin, of course, and then procedures. It could be a plain old balloon angioplasty, even today, rarely. A bare metal, first, second generation drug eluting stents, the latest drug coated stents. And of course, anticoagulation, which appears in every regimen that we'll discuss today not only the vitamin K antagonists, but of course the direct oral anticoagulants that have shown benefits compared to uh, vitamin K antagonists. But the topic today really is how, the management. So how are we going to factor in all these previous elements into our clinical practice? Triple antithrombotic therapy in relation to its duration, a DOAC instead of vitamin K antagonist, dropping one of the antiplatelet agents, if so, the, not the P2Y12 inhibitor immediately, and then, of course, aspirin dropping is a popular topic. <clears throat> 
Now, the simplest way to reduce the bleeding risk, and we've heard from the previous talk the emphasis that bleeding may be a harbinger of adverse outcomes, including death, is to reduce the number of antithrombotic agents. And this is quite clear, for instance, from this huge Danish registry that shows that with one antithrombotic, you have sort of a reference uh, r rate of fatal and non-fatal bleeding, and then it increases almost twofold with two agents, and, th and then three to fourfold if you hop onto a triple antithrombotic regimen. And are we able, therefore, to avoid a triple antithrombotic regimen in the setting of the combination of ACS, PCI, and atrial fibrillation, given that we know quite clearly that dual antiplatelet therapy is really essential, at least early on, to prevent stent thrombosis, and is definitely superior to aspirin alone or to aspirin combined with oral anticoagulation or to anticoagulation alone. And on the other hand, we know quite clearly that anticoagulation is superior to a single or dual antiplatelet regimen in atrial fibrillation in preventing thromboembolic events. And this is really the evidence that is behind the conundrum that I just showed you. On the left, the fairly early trials that looked at post-coronary stenting up to one month after the event, and please focus on aspirin ticlopidine because these were early days, 1990s, how dramatic the reduction in stent thrombosis and in cumulative events shown here compared to anticoagulant therapy alone or combined with aspirin or aspirin alone or the combination again. The first trial uh, proudly was conducted in Europe, and then the American trial, larger population, basically confirmed the main message. And on the right, on the other hand, in atrial fibrillation patients, the, the, the crucial trial was Active W, showing how anticoagulation compared to dual antiplatelet therapy uh, have the risk of stroke over 1.5 years of follow-up. So how are we handling this? The current guidelines that are really the 2015 uh, non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome guidelines propose a practical approach, which I think has still merits. Basically, they're telling us, as uh, Giuseppe also led us to, to um, consider, uh, they're basically telling us to uh, consider a relatively high ischemic risk given the acute coronary syndrome presentation and therefore to focus on the bleeding risk. And here the HASBLED score was proposed because it was the only one at the time, but it's also quite a practical one. I'm sure you know that HASBLED is an acronym for hypertension, abnormal liver, kidney disease, uh, uh, prior stroke, prior bleeding, label INR, which would not apply to the DOAC elderly, and concomitant bleeding-inducing agents. If this HASBLED score is two or below, then you can consider triple antithrombotic for up to six months. If, on the other hand, the bleeding risk is high with a HASBLED of three or above, reduce the duration of triple antithrombotic therapy to up to one month, and then go for a dual regimen where anticoagulation is the constant. You never drop anticoagulation in this non-valvular atrial fibrillation patients, presumably with a CHADS vascular two or above. But let's now, for, and really the, non uh, the uh, latest atrial fibrillation guidelines, 2016, actually are a replication of this. They actually put level of evidence, which I believe perhaps could be updated by the end of the talk. So now let's focus at the evidence, because I think this gives us you know, a, a more clear uh, understanding of what we're doing in, in our clinical practice. We have fa two phase two randomized trials, West and Iser Triple, that looked at about 600 patients followed for one year to, or nine months. These were patients in West that needed aura anticoagulation. Not all of them had atrial fibrillation. And Iser Triple instead had most 
atrial fibrillation patients, and they were undergoing PCI. Not all these patients in any of the trials, not, the totality was never ACS. They were always a fraction of stable patients. But this is the evidence. And West actually continued triple antithrombotic therapy for one year, and rather simply adopted from the very start a dual antithrombotic regimen, vitamin K antagonist, and dropped aspirin with the P2Y12 inhibitor. Why? Because we saw in the early post-coronary stenting trials how aspirin ticlopidine, the P2Y12 inhibitor, was so much superior to aspirin alone or to aspirin combined to anticoagulation. And uh, so then our triple instead looked at basically a triple regimen for six months compared to a triple regimen of six weeks, and then interestingly dropped clopidogrel. So it used aspirin as part of the triple in the first six weeks and then continued with anticoagulation and aspirin alone. These are, of course, mostly safety trials, this, this phase two. I actually reviewed this paper. It had, for the Lancet, it does have many limitations, open label, both of them, uh, reduced number of patients, but it was groundbreaking, I think, and it was really important to get it out. I still believe that. Uh, uh, Isar triple actually had a composite that included major bleeding, and let's have a look at the results. West here. So we have the dual clopidogrel anticoagulation arm here. Any bleeding was the endpoint. This was one criticism. But look at the dramatic decline of having of the rate of bleeding over one year compared to the triple antithrombotic therapy arm. And then another thing came rather, well, this is not surprising, of course. This can be expected. You have three agents compared to two, less bleeding with two agents, of course. But you did not have a price to pay in terms of so-called ischemic endpoints, death or cardiovascular death, presumably much of it, MI, target vessel revascularization, stroke strength thrombosis. If anything, there was actually a significant decline in the rate in the dual antithrombotic arm. And then another surprising thing came out of the trial, despite its many limitations, and that is that the dual antithrombotic regimen had a lower rate of mortality compared to the triple, again suggesting that these bleeds here are perhaps leading to either fatal bleeds or to the interruption of antithrombotic therapy and therefore a rebound of ischemic events. Let's have a look at ISA triple. Now, if you remember here, we had triple for six months and uh, triple for six weeks. So up to six weeks, they're actually identical regimens. So the differences that we see here are actually baseline differences, presumably, that are being carried out. So if you look at the subsequent curves here for the composite endpoints, basically no difference. If you take out bleeding, basically no difference. If you look at bleeding with a fairly sensitive measure, the bark, and you do a landmark analysis, you see that after six weeks, as expected, dual antithrombotic treatment has a lower bleeding rate compared to the, uh, the triple antithrombotic regimen. And this is sort of, the, the message is, therefore, that if you have a dual regimen or anticoagulation plus a single antiplatelet compared to triple, you're going to reduce either any bleeding in West or the bleeding in Bark, any bleeding in eyes or triple without a price to pay, apparently, although there are underpowered studies in terms of ischemic events by dropping one antithrombotic agent. So West and Iser Triple actually have stimulated larger confirmatory trials that have had the opportunity to incorporate the direct oral anticoagulants that meanwhile were being shown to be superior to vitamin K antagonists for atrial fibrillation. And this is sort of a comparative um, methodological slide of the two phase three randomized trials, Pioneer AFPCI and Redual PCI. These are trials that had uh, atrial fibrillation in, in, in all of the patients with PCI uh, proportion, about 50% had also concomitant ACS in both trials. Two to up to almost 3,000 patients, follow-up of one year, 14 months. Rather complex 
uh, design for Pioneer, but the vitamin K antagonist is being replaced by the DOAC, rivaroxaban, at an intermediate high dosing. It's not quite the, the, you know, the recommended dose for atrial fibrillation combined with the P2Y12 inhibitor so-called West-like arm, but West had the vitamin K here, actually. Um, and then we have the so-called Atlas arm, a low-dose rivaroxaban plus dual antiplatelet for variable duration, and then you drop clopidogrel and you increase rivaroxaban. So quite complicated arm there. And the so-called standard triple uh, arm, where again, however, the duration of the triple therapy is 1, 6, 12 months with the dropping of clobidogrel. Safety trials, and in Redul instead, simpler design in that the vitamin K is replaced by the full-dose anticoagulant dosage of the bigotran, either 110 twice daily or 150 twice daily with clopidogrel or ticagrelor. Prasugrel is sort of left out of the picture given its uh, overall higher bleeding profile compared to other P2I12 inhibitors and uh, the vitamin K antagonist plus DAPT uh, for one to three months. Secondary endpoints were efficacy as shown here. And here, again, is the design just to say that it, although this is called West-like, it doesn't have vitamin K, but Serelto, this intermediate to high dose. Here, this intermediate arm is quite complicated. Actually, you have three, variable, three possibilities, uh, this first phase and then followed by Serelto, like here, but aspirin instead of clopidogrel and the triple anti-thrombotic uh, for 1, 6, 12 months. So uh, the basic uh, summary slide for pioneers that compared with standard therapy, rivaroxaban, the doses we saw, plus dual antiplatelet, so uh, low dose rivaroxaban plus DAPT, or intermediate rivaroxaban plus P2Y12 inhibitor, reduces clinically relevant bleeding, as you would expect, with a similar incidence of MACE. So basically, we're actually uh, confirming the phase two trial data. Uh, at that point, we can ask ourselves, is there a need for more data after Pioneer? And according to some, I would say I support this. I would say yes, because that duration in the warfarin arm was still 12 months, for instance, in a good proportion of patients in Pioneer, which is not what the guidelines actually recommend. They recommend up to six months if you have a low bleeding risk and one month if you have a high bleeding risk. There actually wasn't a true warfarin clopidogrel arm and there was not really a power to test efficacy endpoints. So the other large trial is Reduo. The design is shown here. We already looked at it. So please focus on the fact that the triple a so-called triple arm had aspirin that lasted either one month in those that received a bare metal stent or three months in the drug eluting stent arm. Of course, the bigotran is not recommended outside of the United States in those that are 80 years or above or 70 years or above in Japan. So in these patients for redual, the randomization was either warfarin triple therapy or the lower dose of the bigotran. Only in the United States or in patients under 80 or 70 was there this triple randomization. So what does this mean? This means that the higher dose the bigotran patients were actually slightly younger with a slightly better creatinine clearance and a slightly lower chads vas score. The primary endpoint, time to first major clinically relevant non-major bleeding event, as you would expect, was significantly lower, superiorly so with the lower dose of the bigger drank compared to the triple therapy arm, and still non-inferior for the higher dose of the bigger trend compared to the triple. And the rate of intracranial hemorrhage, as we could anticipate from the atrial fibrillation trials with dramatically lower with the DOAC compared to vitamin K antagonist. And again, no price to pay in terms of time to death or thromboembolic vent or uh, 
unplanned revascularization when the dabigatran arms were combined compared to warfarin triple therapy. Now, we should be looking, as we heard earlier in this Congress, at the uh, separate endpoints. And if you want to be quite attentive and perhaps critical, you can appreciate a slightly higher rate of stroke MI stent thrombosis in the lower dose of dabigatran uh, compared to triple, as opposed to the higher dose of dabigatran compared to triple. So my summary and conclusion actually is a discussion with you or a sort of attempt, uh, an attempt to summarize and perhaps to focus on the need to update the guidelines with the fact that what do we have now? We have evidence for triple long in the West, for instance, uh, trial that I believe is really fading out and guidelines are recommending at most one or six months of triple. We have the emerging strong message of dual being proposable, but without, uh, with a P2Y12 inhibitor. If you want to drop something from the very beginning, at the moment at least, we should be dropping aspirin. The Augustus trial will probably provide some more information on that. Because we definitely have less bleeding, perhaps this will impact on mortality, and we don't seem to have a price to pay in terms of increased mortality. This triple duration should be probably not beyond six months and perhaps even one or three months as shown in the redual uh, design. And I believe at the moment that perhaps a full do dose DOAC with the P2Y12 inhibitor is the winner in terms of simplicity and the overall evidence behind it. My very last slide is just to say that there are further trials that are addressing these issues with other DOACs or with warfarin ticagrelor, and they're moving targets in many ways on the topic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk, Dr. Andreotti. And let's move on to the third and last uh, conference, uh, which is uh, New Antithrombotic Strategies in ACS, the escalation of P12, of P12 inhibitors, dual therapy with rivaroxaban and tachyral monotherapy. And again, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Angelillo. You all know them. And thank you, Dominic, for being here. Thank you, Jose Luis, and uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, those in the room are the real champions on a Saturday morning in, in, in Spain. You all deserve an award to uh, come to listen to these lectures. So um, over the next 15 minutes, and I'll uh, try to stay on time, I'll be uh, dealing with these three uh, questions. Uh, I changed a little bit the order, uh, but I'll address them uh, all. We'll start off with uh, uh, dual therapy with uh, Ruroxaban. And, uh, this is our starting point. Uh, we uh, know the value of uh, P2Y12 inhibition in uh, ACS patients, and we know how a more potent blockade further reduces ischemic events. Uh, but one thing that we have learned is that uh, ischemic events still persist, which leads to the question, is there a ceiling effect uh, with P2Y12 uh, uh, blockade? And uh, leads to the question, is there still room for ischemic uh, improvement? And to address the question, we really need to go back to the drawing board and understand the way a thrombotic complications uh, occur. This is what happens in an ACS patient or what we induce in the cat lab when we rupture a plaque. Uh, we have activation of, of two pathways, the cellular one and the coagulation. And typically, in uh, our uh, post-discharge patients, we focus on antiplatelets, forgetting about uh, the role of thrombin, which continues to stimulate uh, uh, platelets. And thrombin remains elevated uh, uh, over time. And so the question is, can you use anticoagulants uh, on top of antiplatelets uh, after, uh, uh, after an ACS event? Now, this slide uh, largely summarizes uh, over 10 years of clinical investigation in the field. I'm going to make a long story very, very short. All agents, or most agents, have been largely uh, studied uh, in the, this context of ACS patients, but only one actually completed phase three clinical testing and met the primary endpoint, which was rivaroxaban in the ATLAS ACS2 trial. And as you can see here, using uh, a very low dose of 2.5 milligrams BID, there was a reduction in the primary endpoint, including a cardiovascular uh, death. 
However, this occurred at the expense of an increased risk of bleeding complications. So uh, overall, the, the trial was not uh, uh, viewed very favorably uh, by some regulators, particularly by the FDA, uh, barely made it into the guidelines. And the problem is that with this strategy and what we've been doing over the course of these years is just stacking on therapies, stacking on. on. So something needs to go because there's an increased risk of bleeding. And so one of the question becomes, can we combine viroxaban safely with a P2Y12 inhibitor and dropping aspirin? And this was actually studied in the uh, Gemini ACS1 uh, uh, study, where it was essentially a randomization of riroxaban versus aspirin. And you can see this is a phase two study. Uh, no differences in, in bleeding, no differences in ischemic events. Some had argued that there was an increased hazard early for both bleeding and uh, uh, thrombosis in the uh, uh, double antithrombotic therapy arm. Nevertheless, the uh, sponsors have decided not to move forward with this uh, uh, program at this time and focus on another program, which is that of stabilized patients. And uh, you've heard already about the, uh, the, the COMPASS trial, and the rationale behind doing this was that uh, patients, stabilized patients, aspirin monotherapy, which is the standard of care, does not completely prevent from ischemic recurrences. So the question becomes, can adding very low dose riroxaban to aspirin uh, improve clinical outcomes? And we uh, spoke about uh, this uh, study at length uh, uh, earlier during this meeting, and we all know that uh, combining very low dose riva on top of aspirin significantly reduces ischemic events compared to aspirin alone. There was no significant benefit of the riva alone arm, and you can see here a 25% relative risk reduction in ischemic events with a significant reduction in death, stroke, and the trend towards a reduction in MI. But again here, a price to pay, which was an increased risk of bleeding, although uh, there weren't any differences in fatal, non-fatal uh, bleeds. And when looking at the net outcomes, uh, overall, the trial was still in favor of Riva. So we'll understand a little bit more about what the regulators will uh, think about the trial, as this is currently uh, under review and uh, ultimately also see how the guidelines will uh, include this in our practice uh, algorithms. So we're gonna go now to the next uh, 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 bullet point, which is that of uh, de-escalation. Now, de-escalation um, is a relatively new term, and it falls within the overall context of switching. Now, for all the clinicians in the room, uh, I pre assume that uh, almost all of you, at some point in time in your practice, you've had to switch uh, P2I12 inhibitors, either going from clopidogrel to prasugrel, clopidogrel to ticagrelor, between prasugrel and ticagrelor, vice versa, or going from the more potent agents back to clopidogrel. There's a lot of confusion, and based on this confusion, there was an uh, international endeavor to try to provide some clarity on the topic of switching, and uh, one of the uh, aspects that uh, we elaborate is that of de-escalation. So the definition of de-escalation is switching from a more potent agent, prasugrel or ticagrel, to clopidogrel. And this now has become as a strategy to reduce uh, uh, bleeding events uh, without a trade-off in ischemic uh, uh, protection. And uh, the rationale behind uh, the concept of de-escalation, as we all know, uh, we go back to the pivotal trials with more potent therapies, you reduce ischemic events, but there is more bleeding. And one thing that we've learned about the bleeding is that uh, the bleeding accrues uh, over time, and some of the ischemic benefit is mitigated. So one can say, well, we treat with more potent therapies early, and then de-escalate uh, to a less potent agent, such as a, a clopidogrel. Now, the first uh, trial to look into this is the topic study, and you can see here, uh, this is a trial that we're at one month. Patients uh, were uh, switched uh, to, um, uh, uh, from prasugrel to ticagrel to clopidogrel, or remained uh, on, uh, on the uh, treatment that they were treated with in the first place. And you can see there was a reduction in the primary endpoint, largely driven uh, by a reduction in bleeding complications. Now, a word of caution with this study, I thought the study was largely underpowered. Uh, there was uh, no inclusion of myocardial infarction in the, uh, in the definition. Nevertheless, a provocative study. 
However, we have the other uh, uh, side of the equation where uh, looking at registries, this is a registry coming from Italy, the SCOPE registry, where those patients who did de-escalate, they call it downgrade, I prefer the term de-escalate, mostly early, there was an increase in ischemic events. So the topic of de-escalation is not that clear. And so when I'm asked the question, uh, should we routinely de-escalate, the answer is probably not. I would say definitely not. Uh, we need to identify patients first who can benefit. Definitely probably those with a history of major bleeding, those with, uh, uh, with high bleeding risk, patients with low ischemic risk. Now, uh, there's a lot of questions surrounding uh, the role of platelet function in genetic testing as a guidance to the uh, escalation. There is one trial, uh, which is the uh, tropical ACS, uh, which was uh, recently reported in The Lancet. And this was a study where patients were all treated with prasugrel at the beginning. And then after one week, uh, they were switched to, they were randomized to continue on standard treatment or to uh, de-escalate to clopidogrel, and they were tested. If they had a good response, they stayed on clopidogrel. If they had a, a poor response, they went back to prasugrel. And you can see the primary endpoint uh, of non-inferiority was, uh, was met, although there were no significant differences in, in bleeding. That's a long story, but the primary endpoint was met. It's the first trial, first trial with platelet function testing that actually meets the primary uh, endpoint. It's not that practical, however, because you have to switch, test, eventually switch back. So there's a lot more interest in, the, in genetic testing, and there are a large number of randomized trials testing the concept of the de-escalation using genetic testing. So there's going to be a lot to speak about in the years to come. This has also become uh, possible thanks to rapid assays. Uh, this is one of the assays. We've actually implemented this in all our patients uh, coming to the CAT lab where you can get results of genetic testing on CYP2C19 in less than one hour. I'm going to finalize with uh, uh, P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy, in other words, stopping uh, aspirin. Uh, we already heard from uh, Dr. Andriotti the uh, pivotal VUS trial, which was actually the first trial to show that when stopping aspirin in patients on the background of uh, oral anticoagulant therapy, we significantly reduce bleeding and we also have a reduction in ischemic events. So a concept that led leading to a paradigm shift in interventional pharmacology, which is, is it time to drop aspirin? Now, the AFib concept is a very different concept. Let's move over to patients who do not need an oral anticoagulant. And one of the things that we've uh, done for the past several decades in interventional pharmacology is always add an agent on top of aspirin, always. So the question here becomes, can we flip the, the equation? Can we think about a background therapy of P2I12 inhibitors and add on, on top of these? Now, the rationale behind this, again, comes from the bench. And you can see here a number of in vitro investigations showing that when you have very potent P2I12 blockade, adding aspirin essentially does not add much. And so can you take this concept and put it in a clinical setting? Well, when it comes to ticagular, for example, in addition to showing what we just showed before, you also have the benefit of the dual pathway by blocking adenosine uptake and having another mechanism to, uh, 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 for cardiovascular uh, uh, protection. And on top of that, we know that with ticagular, and this is coming from the uh, FDA, uh, we've learned that uh, there is a potential, though not demonstrated uh, from a pharmacologic standpoint, of a drug interaction with aspirin dose. So when you go with high doses of aspirin, you reduce the effect. You need to stay with low dose of aspirin. But there is the hypothesis, if we take aspirin away, can you even further reduce uh, ischemic uh, events? A large number of trials that are ongoing, I just highlighted here the, the two big ones in PCI, which are the Twilight and the Global Leaders, both considering a ticagla monotherapy strategy, and that we'll have the results of these uh, studies very, very soon. So to conclude, uh, do we still need aspirin? In my opinion, the answer is, is definitely yes. Uh, we have these uh, uh, very uh, intriguing and, and interesting studies that are that are ongoing, but again, aspirin remains the workhorse uh, a drug. A lot of of great evidence, a lot of new formulations uh, 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 with aspirin, and we still need to see the results of these studies. And also keep in mind that uh, there's a lot of research going in the aspirin world as well. Uh, we've always considered aspirin as a typical anti-platelet and anti-inflammatory drug, but a lot of research going on on looking at aspirin uh, for chemo prevention.
and a number of studies going on in this field. So definitely aspirin is here to stay. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dominique, for a usual very good presentation. Now it's time to the uh, discussion, so uh, I hope a lot of questions from the audience. We have a minute. It's a question from Chema de la Torre here. Can you bring a micro, please? First of all, congratulations to all the speakers because have been great presentations. The, this field has been really amazing because years ago it was so simple, like uh, one month for bare metals, 12 months for dark gluten stents, and that's it. And for the people with AFIF, to be on triple as much as you could. But now we have uh, a lot of trials, many trials, and hundreds of thousands of patients. My question is for uh, expert in statistics like Dr. Biondi Chokai. With all these powerful statistic programs and techniques we have now, and thousands and thousands of patients, the most we were able to help the people to individualize the therapies, just do a score with the dichotomic values, just two, and the other one just 25, and that's it. The other is just, well, you have to balance their ischemic risks, their bleeding risks, but the people really do not know how to do that. And even they are not using the scores. And then it's becoming so complex that I am starting to see a very simplistic approach for many people saying, this is so crazy, it's so difficult that I give the same like before. <laughs> Six months for all of them. And for AFIF, I don't know, triple for two months, and that's it. They are not individualizing because we are not providing them really helpful tools to do it. And my question is, why is it so difficult for statistics with such a huge amount of data we have now to develop more, I don't know, maybe it's, uh, it's a bit uh, naive uh, thought, but the scores or scales that are really more valuable than just two scores with two values, and that's it. I, I might uh, answer this by asking you how you choose uh, your car. So do you just check uh, the speed maximum speed, the, um, the, the efficiency, or say the dimensions. So people will not buy a car because they say that the statistical test is significant in favor of say uh, a Kia instead of an Audi. I think uh, the problem with statistics is that uh, when you have big numbers, uh, you get a kind of a spurious precision, uh, which is a means that I might seem very precise, but I'm not. And this is actually, uh, unfortunately, true because let, let's take scores. For instance, the APT score. The best score, if it's not uh, you know, a fake one, will have 90% uh, capacity to precisely. It means that in this room, uh, if I use the score in everybody, uh, maybe 10 people would be misclassified. And the other thing I think it's crucial is that uh, all these composite endpoints, uh, they give the same weight to every endpoint, which is okay, but it's uh, ludicrous because death is not the same thing as, a, as a, an MI. Today's MIs are infraclets. But the problem is if I move into uh, saying I give a subjective weight, your weight is not the same as mine or hers. So I think in the end, uh, I think your approach is not a, a bad approach. We need to, to find our own receipt, like for doing a paella. I, I learned that in Galicia you have to add the saffron to paella because it's as it is done here. And uh, recognize its limitation, but also uh, the fact that uh, in a given patient, uh, these numbers are not meaningless, but uh, difficult to apply directly. Antonio? Question from Antonio Fernandez Ortiz. Yeah, uh, thank you. This is a question for Dominic. Um, I, I am a little bit surprised of here again about uh, genetic testing for the escalating because I mean, it has been a fail for escalating the therapy. So the question is, do, are these the same genes? Do you really 
believe that this is going to reach to the guidelines or? So uh, we, we implemented the genetic testing as, as actually a quality improvement project. And the quality improvement was based on uh, an NIH, a very big NIH funding, uh, to see the way physicians will utilize genetic testing in their clinical practice. The goal is not to say we're going to have an impact on, on, on outcomes. And the, uh, and the second is feasibility, because we wanted to see if you, can you truly do something as trendy as genetic testing in real world. So we also found it useful because in, in U.S. practice, we have a large number of, uh, of uninsured patients. And um, we want to feel a little bit safer, although there's not a lot of evidence. There's registry has evidence that if you de-escalate to a clopidogrel and you're a good metabolizer, you're a little bit safer. But I agree with you that we need clinical trials. The only one that's out there is the farm close study presented at the ACC. I have some reservations. They're my Italian colleagues, but I have some reservations on, on, on the trial. Uh, but there are a large number of big randomized trials. So as a person who works in the field for almost 20 years, we have to try to see if this works and do it. And we find it very, uh, very useful for some, some patients because it's an electronic medical record and it helps you a little bit with your decision making, just like a CBC. There's a question from Dr. Antonina Sambola. Congratulations for all speakers. I would like to know at the end, what is your opinion about the treatment in patients with acute coronary syndrome and uh, atrial fibrillation? Dual therapy as a pioneer strategy or triple, triple therapy with uh, BKA? Do you have the protocol in your hospital? Um, uh, yes, I think the idea of, of is a good one actually because you're taking into account you know the hard team concept the local expertise the availabilities the experience etc um, i perhaps overemphasize the fact that in my view because of simplicity and because of the evidence that is coming to the surface uh, there's an attractive uh, 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 profile for the DOAC full dose to sort of cover and tackle the atrial fibrillation and the P2Y12 inhibitor. Having said that, I agree that at least one month of triple is, you know, uh, the, the inherited scheme that we have most experience with. It's uh, recommended by the current guidelines at least for one month. Um, it, it, you know, it, it, it's something that the guidelines have not, uh, it's something that, it's there in the guidelines and because the trials that are coming forth are actually either more recent or not really powered to answer the ischemic outcome uh, feature. Uh, having said that, there is the lower bleeding rate, there is the, perhaps the benefits even in terms of ischemic and mortality endpoints. Uh, so, you know, I think one idea was to have a protocol in the hospital uh, that is supported by an exchange a good knowledge of the evidence as it comes out and the clinical sort of uh, expertise of applying something that at least is a method for your practice as a clinician. For instance, I'm still quite attached to the has bled concept or I, if I do you know, bleeding risk scores, I definitely look at clinical elements like hemoglobin, creatinine clearance, prior bleeding risk, uh, age, um, so it's a synthesis that sort of reaps from a lot of things. 
It's actually very interesting because there's a lot of uh, gray areas in this uh, triple versus dual, uh, direct versus uh, vitamin K antagonist. And for example, I fully agree with Dr. Andretti with the thing that maybe in the first month with, uh, where there's a cluster of ischemic events, maybe you need to be a little more aggressive with antithrombotic therapy. But on the other side, I know that in the U from the U.S. perspective, actually I think you are betting on uh, using dual therapy from the very beginning in a lot of patients, but my question for Dominic here would be, okay, but let's say you are using from the very beginning dual therapy with uh, a direct or oral anticoagulant and uh, a pitoid 12 inhibitor. Okay, <coughs> which one do you choose? Because if you use ticagrelor, for example, I'm not that certain that dual therapy with ticagrelor would bleed less than triple therapy with clopidogrel. And on the other side, if you use clopidogrel, if you choose clopidogrel, what happens with the 30% of people, more or less, that are not good responders to clopidogrel? So, so all, 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 yeah, all valid points. And so I spoke about this the other day. The strategy of a double antithrombotic is most likely to be the proposal in our updated uh, consensus, which is in, in, in preparation and which, which I chair. And, um, but if you look at the evidence, you take the three major trials, Roost, Pioneer, and Redual, they all show that double antithrombotic therapy wins without a trade-off in bleeding. So it's not that we all systematically consider double from the beginning. Most, uh, many operators do keep at least one month uh, uh, of aspirin. Now to address the question of clopidogrel or ticagrelor, and get it back to Antonio's question. So if I know that patient, just because I did it in the medical record, he's star one, star one, I feel comfortable on clopidogrel. If he's star two, star two, I'll put him on ticagrelor. There's not a lot of evidence, but I know that clopidogrel is not going to work in that patient. And the best evidence from, uh, from Redual, there was 10% of patients treated with ticagrelor, and the data were consistent. Is there risk for more bleeding? Yes, but I would never add aspirin if the patient's also on ticagrelor. So, so thank you again to, to the three excellent presenters. This is a very good discussion, but there is no time, so we have to leave this. Yeah. Thank you to the speakers and to the audience.